And now I invite you to open your Bibles, first of all, to Psalm 22. It is my custom to connect the dots, if you will, between the Testaments each time I preach. I take a New Testament text, we read the, the context of that passage, and then I, we read in the other Testament something that connects that theme or that fleshes out that theme in the other Testament or covenant. So we turn first to Psalm 22, if you will. And just read a portion of this very famous, explicitly messianic psalm. It is that first verse in 2222 that I want to call your attention to, especially where Jesus, it is predicted that Jesus has and will declare the Father's name to his people. We have that famous quotation there in Psalm 2222, which reads, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him. And fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard, My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. And then now, if you would turn please to John 17 where we find our sermon text, John 17. There's a long, long high priestly prayer of our Lord and Savior, but we are focusing just on those last few verses of that prayer in our sermon text, but we will read for context beginning at verse 17. Let us hear God's word. In fact, the words of Jesus himself as he prays. Verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me. And have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. That they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you. But I have known you. And these have known you. Excuse me. These have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. When Jesus had spoken these words, chapter 18, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Just that far in God's Word. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, you remember not too long ago, in fact, his, I saw his face on a tabloid even this week at the supermarket, you remember the death of Robin Williams, a celebrity who obviously had no love for our Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore no comfort in life or in death. 
By way of contrast, we, by God's grace, every Christian can say with confidence, my only comfort in life and in death is that I belong, body and soul, both in life and death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with His precious blood has fully satisfied for all my sins and redeemed me from all the power of the devil. There is one benefit that only Christians have, and we have it here. And that is to have not just someone praying for you, but to have our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, praying for you as your intercessor. How awesome that is. And so here, we see just before Jesus is about to be betrayed by Judas, we see Jesus interceding for His disciples, filled with tenderness, filled with love for them and for us. And that very fact is visibly displayed before us also today in the elements of the Lord's Supper. We have set before us these visible tokens and signs and seals of our high priest's intercession for us. Jesus prays for us, and we'll see three, three things about that this morning. One, I hope that you have been able to receive an outline that I neglected to put into your bulletins before the service. Jesus prays for us, one, that we will be with Him and behold His glory. Secondly, His prayer results in our acknowledging His gracious work. And thirdly, Jesus prays for us that we may have the Father's love and Christ Himself within us. Those three things. Jesus prays for us, first of all, that we may be with Him and behold His glory. That could certainly be a sermon all by itself, but we'll just take it as one part of it, the closing of His prayer this morning. First of all, we see in this verse 24 the scope of this request that Jesus makes to the Father. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. Back in chapter 10, Jesus had already promised that all his sheep have eternal life and shall never perish. Verse 27 of John 10 reads this way, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. And at the beginning of this same discourse that we have in front of us, after the Last Supper, he had already promised in chapter 11 that they would be with him where he was going. You remember also in John 14, Jesus said, In my Father's house, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And so what Christ prays for here in verse 24, beloved, and is what He promises here as well. Eternal, unbroken union and perfect, continuous communion with Him forever and ever. Not only in this corruptible body for our sojourn here on earth, but this corruptible body will put on incorruption, the Apostle tells us, and we will then spend eternity with our Savior. And what we have this not only this worship service, but the communion service is a foretaste of that special and blessed communion that we will enjoy, that one of your sisters is enjoying already. We read about it this in First Thessalonians 4, a verse that you know very well. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first and then we who are alive, alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And you remember the next words. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. This is what Jesus is praying for here in verse 24 when he prays, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me 
may be with me where I am. Jesus will dwell among us as He did in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. He will dwell among us as He did with the disciples for those three years. Imagine having fellowship with Jesus, not only by faith as we do now, but by sight, by sound, hearing His voice, by touch even. Imagine Jesus Christ, your beloved Savior, shaking your hand or placing His hand upon your shoulder. Christ prays for that which is the greatest expectation of every true Christian. That they may behold my glory, he goes on to pray, which you have given me, for you have loved me from before the foundation of the world. When that day comes, we will not see the man of sorrows acquainted with grief that we've read about in his crucifixion. We'll not see he who one despised and rejected of men. We will see Jesus in his majestic, glorified state. And we are told that in 1 John 3 where John writes, Now we are the children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And John by inspiration goes on to describe Jesus as he is in his glorified state in the book of Revelation chapter 1 where he says that he saw in the midst of the seven lampstands one like the Son of Man clothed with a garment down to the feet girded about his chest with a golden band. He had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And already there is in that description a warning to anyone who has of yet not possessed or received this promise, this prayer on, your, on behalf of Christians that you will be with Jesus where he is. This promise is only for those who have repented of their sins and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as the only one who can bring them to that dear land of rest. But brothers and sisters, the promise, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus desires that you also, the ones whom the Father has given to Him, may be with Him where He is, that you may behold His glory which the Father has given to him. And may these thoughts of your blessed future strengthen you and make the difficulties of life you will face this week and in the weeks to come easier to bear. Just a few more years, beloved, for some of us fewer than others, and you will be with your Savior forever. Would you turn in your hymnals to hymn number 539? We're not going to sing, but I just want to have you see this visibly with your eyes. Just these first two stanzas of, that remind us of that blessed communion that we will enjoy with Christ forever and ever. Jerusalem the golden, 539, with milk and honey blessed, Beneath your contemplation sink heart and voice oppressed. I know not, I know not what joys await us there. What radiance of glory, what bliss beyond compare. They stand those halls of Zion all jubilant with song and bright with many an angel and all the martyr song. But here's the best part. The prince is ever in them. The daylight is serene. The pastures of the blessed are decked with glorious sheen. That's what we have to look forward to. That's what Jesus is praying for in verse 24. But how is this great hope and expectation possible for sinners like you and me? The answer, because you loved me before the laying down of the world, before the foundation of the world. God the Father loved the Son so much, even before He created the earth, that He has glorified Him with eternal 
unimaginable, heavenly glory which every true Christian will gaze upon one day. Calvin says it this way. I think it, this was up on the screen earlier. At that time they saw Christ's glory as someone shut up in the dark sees a feeble and glimmering light through small cracks. Christ now wants to go on to, in, to have them go on to enjoy the full brightness of heaven. Now he says that the Father's love is its cause. And so it follows that he was loved inasmuch as he was appointed as the world's redeemer. The Father embraced Him with that love before the creation of the world so that He might be the one in whom the Father would love His chosen people. End quote. And so our Savior in turn, having been loved by the Father since before the foundation of the world, our Savior in turn loved us, brothers and sisters, so much that He does not want to be separated from us one more minute than necessary. I was at a wedding this past weekend you know, able to marry a young man who I had catechized as a boy. And as you, you've been to weddings, you remember the, view, the, the sight of the groom waiting for his bride to come down the aisle and her anxiously anticipating meeting him at the front. What a blessed picture of the, the happy reunion that we will have as the bride of Christ with our bridegroom. And so, presently, Jesus also. Not only is this a future hope, though, beloved. There is a present reality to this as well. That they, we may, as Jesus prays, that He may be with us where He is. And we have a, a sign and seal of that set before us even now in the elements of the Lord's Supper. And your own directory of worship reminds us of that where it says the supper is a bond and pledge of the communion that believers have, not will have, but have with Him and with each other as members of His body. And it goes on to say the supper anticipates, indeed there is a future aspect, the supper anticipates the consummation of the ages when Christ returns to gather all His redeemed people at the glorious wedding feast of the Lamb. So we have a taste of that already. Jesus Christ, it is true, has as the God-man, the perfect God-man, has alone, has perfect knowledge of God the Father. He is always perfectly, excuse me, I got ahead of myself there. That's the first thing. Jesus prays for us that we will be with Him and behold His glory. The second thing in this prayer, His prayer results in our acknowledging His gracious work. And we've already hinted at that. Verse 25 now. Here we have in verse 25 the basis of our acknowledging His gracious work. How is it that we can be with Him where He is? Because He has given us the grace to acknowledge His gracious work. He says, he prays in verse 25, Righteous Father, the world has not known You, but I have known You. And so he here shows us how the world lacks two key elements of faith. Biblical knowledge and assent or consent to that knowledge. But on the other hand, our Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man, He alone has perfect, inexhaustible knowledge of God the Father. He has always, as our substitute, perfectly assented and consented to all that the Father has revealed. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. But by grace, beloved brothers and sisters, we do know that the Father sent His Son for us. Verse 25, Jesus says, These have known. The world doesn't know this. But these have known that You sent Me. Now, as we think about the context here, the apostles had just acknowledged Christ's person and work. If you turn your page back just a couple 
pay, a page or so in John 16, 29, you hear this confession from their lips. His disciples said to him in 16, 29, See, now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. They had acknowledged the Son, knowing that such an acknowledgement on their part meant that they too would be abused and possibly even killed. And you too, by God's grace in Christ, beloved Christians, have acknowledged the Son. And so Jesus prays for us, contrasting on the one hand the world who is ignorant of His person and work with His sheep, focusing then us on the Father's love for us in Christ. This is a sobering thought. When you think about it, 7 billion people plus in the world and 90% of the world's population rejects Christ. Rejects the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, but attacks conservative Protestant Christians. But no matter. The Father remains the righteous Father. That rejection does not affect Him in the least. But by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, you know that, that the Father has sent the Son. That is an extremely high privilege and honor. You know that He sent His Son to redeem and purchase you, body and soul, from sin and from all the power of the devil. Because the Father is righteous... He applies the merits of His Son to your account in justification as those He has given to Christ. And so, this expression of Christ's love, and these have known that you have sent me, is reserved for you and I and others like us who have by God's grace acknowledged Him as your prophet and priest and king sent by the Father you have acknowledged the Father as the one who sent Him and you have acknowledged the Father's purpose and the Son's purpose in becoming our God-man Redeemer and Mediator. So rejoice, all you Christians, you who have been made to know that God the Father has sent His Son into the world to save rebellious sinners like you and me from our sins. You have been privileged among, you are among the privileged few in this world who have been given the gift of faith to know that God sent His only begotten Son to bear your guilt and the punishment that was due your sins. Jesus prays for us that we will be with Him and behold His glory. He pray, his prayer results in our acknowledging His gracious work. And then, lastly, he prays that we may have the Father's love and Christ Himself w w within us. Verse 26. He prays that we may have the Father's love and Christ Himself within us. He prays, first of all, in verse 26, about His past, present, and future declaration of our Father's name. And I have declared to them your name or let me change the emphasis and I have declared to them your name Jesus is our chief prophet and teacher and as such he revealed the father first of all to the apostles in new ways to new degrees as never before revealed on the pages of the Old Testament for example the doctrine of justification fleshed out by the Apostle Paul. The doctrine of the Trinity so beautifully laid out on the pages of the New Testament revealing the mystery of that from the Old Testament. Just to name a couple. This is one way that Jesus had declared to them in particular the name of the Father. Jesus Christ enabled and caused the Apostles to visibly witness and behold in His Son the Father's love, the Father's power, and wisdom, and knowledge, and justice, and holiness, and goodness, and truth, and mercy, and kindness. And those are synonymous with His name. 
these attributes of God had been made known first to the apostles. And in the pages of the New Testament, we behold too those attributes of the Father. And when we see Jesus on the pages of Scripture, even in this high priestly prayer, we also see the Father. Jesus said Himself, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. In the death of the Son, which we celebrate today again, the love and the mercy and the justice and the holiness of the Father are made crystal clear to us. In the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus declared the power of God to conquer death and sin and the devil more clearly, more loudly than ever before in the Old Testament. In His ascension, He declared the reign of God over His kingdom in and through His Son. That's in the past. I have declared my name, your name. But there's a present declaration as well. He says, I have and I will declare it. Think about that now. From that time that Jesus uttered this prayer, now 19 centuries plus later, Christ has declared for those 19 centuries the person and work of the Father to His church. Every Lord's Day, including this one, through faithful preachers, that declaration goes forth. The, de that declaration of the name and attributes of the Father. But there is a future declaration his, here as well when He says, I will continue to declare that name. Until Christ returns, what a comfort it is to know that your children, your grandchildren, will hear Christ declare the person and work of the Father through faithful preachers. Yes, we worry about future generations of Americans, and rightly so. But one thing is certain, beloved. No generation of God's elect will fail to hear His name proclaimed. Jesus prays that we may have the Father's love and Christ Himself within us. And so He prays about His past, present, and future declaration of the Father's name. And also, He prays about the purposes for declaring this name of the Father, past, present, and future. The first purpose of the declaration of this name of the Father by the Son is that we might have the Father's love within us. Verse 26 says, Jesus says, And will declare it, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them. And consider the fullness of God's love, the Father's love, as Jesus expressed it in His entire prayer here in John 17. And may I give you a homework assignment here to read this prayer, ch chapter 17, this week. To sum it up, the Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. The Son loves those that the Father has given Him. The Father loves those that He has given to the Son. Christians love the Father. Christians love the Son. All of those themes are there in John 17. And so Jesus is praying that you and I might have close and continuous communion with God the Father. Again, represented here on the, in the table of the Lord. Jesus is praying that we might realize and recognize that our Heavenly Father loves us. That we are His beloved adopted children by grace through faith in His Son. That our Father loves us with the same love which He demonstrated for His only begotten Son. That's what the text says. So that we can say every week, week in and week out, though I do not understand, Father, what you are doing in my life, I know that you love me. With the Apostle, we can confidently say we glory in tribulations knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint. Why? Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. 
For in due time, when we were without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ prays about two purposes for declaring the name of the Father in the past, present, and future. First, declaring the Father's name that we might have the Father's love within us. And secondly, Jesus prays that He Himself may be in us. Verse 26 goes on to say, and I in them. There's a lot in those few words. Jesus explained what he means by and I in them in John 15. And I'll give you one more homework assignment to read that chapter also this week. To summarize John 15, Christ is the vine. We are as branches abide in him. Without him we can do nothing. But with him abiding in us, we bring forth spiritual fruit. Christ's words abide in us by His grace and Spirit. His words in us enable us to be His disciples. Christ's love in us enables us to continue in His love. Another quote from Calvin, please. Quote, strictly speaking, the love that God has for us is that which He had for His Son from the beginning. And so it makes us acceptable too and lovable to Him in Christ. Apart from Christ, we are hated by God. He only begins to love us when we are united to the body of His beloved Son. It is an inestimable privilege of faith that we know that Christ was loved by the Father for our sake that we might share the same love forever. End quote. And once again, the Lord's Supper testifies all of that to us. Christ's joy remains in us so that our joy might be full in Him. Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you that my joy might remain in you, that your joy might be full. Union with, with Christ, beloved, which is presented here for us in the bread and wine, means that He lives in us by means of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Would you turn your Bibles to Galatians 2? There's a, and keep your finger here in John. There's a verse there that, again, is very familiar to most of you, but one that bears repeating. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians 2, 20. We read there, Remember, the focus of the text at this point is Jesus is praying, I in them. And what do we read in Galatians 2.20? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Matthew Henry, commenting on this text, said, It is the glory of the Redeemer to dwell in the redeemed. It is His rest forever, and He has desired it. Let us, therefore, make sure our union with Christ and then take the comfort of His intercession. Brothers and sisters, the Father loves us because the Son lives in us. The Son lives in us because the Father loves us. The Father sees Christ, our head, and sees us, His Son's bride and body. So rejoice as you head home today and throughout this week and as you come to the table of the Lord now that Jesus prays for us, Jesus prays for you. He prays that we will be with Him and behold His glory. His prayer results in our acknowledging His gracious work. And He prays that we may have the Father's love and Christ Himself within us. Amen.